In 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. I'm going to share some of my personal Venice experiences and some stories from my visit to La Serenissima, the fabled city of Venice. The best hotels, some of my favorite restaurants and places to eat, and some of the hidden attractions that may or may not be on the regular uh, tourist maps. With its untouched, incredible architectural heritage, the spectacular Grand Canal and unmatched romantic vibes. There's no question why people from all around the world hold Venice as one of their dream bucket list destinations. And also why hordes, hordes of, tourists of tourists flock, flock in their in masses. masses. Venice is one of the most magical places on planet Earth. There's an incredible Renaissance feeling to the whole place. Mostly sparked by the centuries old unchanged buildings, an incredible setting. And probably most importantly, as there are no roads, no cars, no scooters, no mopeds, no vespers, everything is experienced by either by foot or by boat, by gondola, by vaporetto, by water taxi or classic riva. So you feel like you're stepping back in time through some magical Harry Potter-esque portal into a world of art and masterpieces. And it, the whole city is a masterpiece when you come to Venice. Any tourist could spend forever, weeks and weeks, exploring the city's labyrinth of islands, 
canals, pedestrian alleyways and bridges. One of the really remarkable things about Venice that you won't find anywhere else in the world is the Venice Carnival. It's an internationally renowned event that takes place annually in the beautiful city. Known for its elaborate costumes, masks and parties, the carnival draws visitors from all around the world to experience the unique and ancient tradition. And it's in winter <clears throat> and Venice is, you know, unusually, has an unusual climate and at many times because of the, the Grand Canal and the lagoons and everything, they get these incredible mists rolling in. So you've got the lights and, you know, the, the, the dark of Venice and the romantic feelings and through this mist and it's like some weird movie set. It is actually extraordinary. Well, the origins of the carnival can be traced back to the 12th century, when the city of Venice was a thriving center of trade and commerce. Now, at that time, Venice was a republic, and its citizens enjoyed a great deal of freedom and autonomy. The carnival was a time when the strict social hierarchies and class distinctions of a very stuffy Venetian society were temporarily suspended, allowing people of all classes to come together and celebrate. It kind of reminds me about the carnival in Rio. Um, it has a similar kind of egalitarian thing where everybody gets together and has fun. But the Venice one is obviously very different. The masks worn were a crucial part of the celebration. And the masks were a way of people who were able to then escape their everyday lives and social roles and let loose with gay abandon, without judgment. The most popular masks were the Bauta and the Moretta. The Bauta was a full face mask and a long nose, which was often worn with a you know, wide brimmed hat, which covered the head and shoulders. The Moretta, on the other hand, was a black domino mask, often worn by the women. Now these masks were not only popular with the general population, but also with the wealthy who would also don elaborate costumes and masks to conceal their identities so they could participate in all the various parties and events. It's probably where Stanley Kubrick got his idea for Eyes Wide Shut. Over the centuries, the carnival evolved and changed. And in the 18th century, the carnival reached the height of its popularity with elaborate balls, parades, and performances taking place in the city's grand palaces and squares. However, in the 19th century, the carnival began to decline. And in 1797, the Venetian Republic fell and the carnival was banned by the Austrians who controlled Venice. Those Austrians. The carnival was revived in the 1970s and right to this very day, it attracts visitors from all over the world. The modern carnival features many of the same elements as the historical carnival, including the elaborate costumes, masks, and parties. The legend of Casanova. Casanova was a legendary lover and a libertine of Venice. He was kind of the perfect incarnation of 18th century Venice, which was a world of frivolity, dissolution, partying, gambling, banquets, and daring escapades. Sounds like a fun time to be had. And Giacomo Casanova was a philanderer, an explorer, a writer, a mathematician, philosopher, and also a secret agent. He wasn't just a Venetian Lothario. And his life was a heady mixture of luxury, adventures, love affairs, and gambling but also squalid prison cells, daring midnight escapes through canals, an exile and endless adventure. Casanova's house, garden and cafes can still be explored through special Casanova tours and there's even a museum. Casanova was born in Venice in 1725. He went on to become the city's favorite son, celebrated not just for the fact he invented the state lottery in France, or for helping Mozart create his masterpiece, the Don Giovanni Opera, nor even that he penned 42 novels and was an influential mathematician. 
Instead, ironically, he's famed all over the world and especially worshipped by the gondoliers of Venice for his notorious womanizing, as detailed in explicit form in his autobiographical masterpiece, The Story of My Life, which at 12 volumes and 3,600 pages were unfinished at the time of his death in 1798. In truth, Casanova only spent part of his life in Venice, as he was banned from the city for his hedonistic lifestyle, going on to become one of the first travel writers in history, detailing the time he spent in Naples, Rome, Constantinople, Paris, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Rome, Prague, amongst many others. Kind of sounds like somebody I know. He was son of a widowed actress, and he was born, as I said, in 1725 in the district of San Marco and was soon left to care for his grandmother. Erotic poet Giorgio Baffo, an ardent admirer of Casanova's mother, was the first to initiate him into the art of seduction. In addition to women, Casanova loved eating and drinking, banquets and chiquetteria, the wine bars where you can eat and drink and sample local specialties. He will be forever remembered as a part of the mythology of Venice. With its 150 canals, 400 bridges, and magnificent 16th and 17th century palaces and piazzas, it's no surprise that Venice is considered one of the most magical cities in all of Europe. And it's only natural that the hotels inside Italy's floating city offer up Baroque bedrooms draped in decadent velvets and brocades. Now, Venice is no stranger to the hordes when the crowds come, mostly to chase that elusive canal view. If you have deep pockets, you can get a VIP front row seat to such sought after sites. And there's some amazing palace-like hotels you can stay in. Il Palazzo Experimentale enjoys postcard views over the Guadeca Canal. The garden at the St. Regis overlooks the Grand Canal. But it's not all velvet decadence with million dollar views. Venice is also home to some really charming boutique stays as well. And these days you can also find some incredibly unique Airbnb options with views and home comforts. Now I'm going to feature three hotels which I've personally experienced and are mind-blowing. <clears throat> the first is Hotel Danielli, which is not too far from the Hotel Metropole, where Nikki and I once stayed when we had our dramatic adventure in, in Venice. It's a 14th century gem of Venetian Gothic architecture and the Danielli is the flagship of Venetian hospitality and glamour salon for the sophisticated elite since 1822. Now the Danielli has 210 rooms and suites, welcoming guests across its three palaces to sumptuous, elegant surroundings reflecting the rich cultural history of Venice. French interior designer Pierre Yves Rochon has masterfully detailed the, the unique signature suites inspired by glamorous female celebrities of cinema, opera and fashion who selected Hotel Danielli to celebrate important milestones in their lifetimes. And then there is the Hotel Cipriani. Set on the beautiful Guedeca Island, the Belmond Hotel Cipriani was dreamed up in the same era that gave the world the romantic films like a Roman holiday and summertime. And the appeal of it, the allure, the charisma, everything shouts Hollywood glamour. And it's a magnet for movie stars and A-listers. Away from the ceaseless hustle and bustle of central Venice, you can soak up the romance here. 
on its own private island. And the rooms are bedecked with Venetian style furnishings. There's the Casanova Gardens, where famed author Giacomo Casanova once wooed his lovers, and where the vistas of Venice are picture perfect, so you'll pinch yourself to make sure you're not dreaming. And whether you pull up directly at the private dock or hop onto the hotel launch at Piazza San Marco for the journey across the lagoon, the super attentive service, manicured greenery, and the air of sophistication combine to a pampered world like none other on the, on the planet. It was created by Giuseppe Cipriani of Harry's Bar fame, which is also located on the property, in 1958. And the Cipriani has remained the essence of Venetian luxury through its various rebrandings. And now it's under the Belmont flag. And it's added the Michelin starred Oro restaurant to its gamut of glamorous offerings. Come around film festival time, the Venice Film Festival, late August, early September, and you'll see a, a gamut of A-list stars. And you can rub shoulders with directors and producers but the vibe is moneyed and storied, self-assured all year round, with splashes of international colour, from entertainers to even royalty. And Venice, in the distance, remains a shimmering vision across the water, conceptually very close, but physically quite far. And the only obvious way of exiting is by boat. And for many guests, that's Cipriani's unique value proposition. And then there is the legendary Gritti Palace. Overlooking the Grand Canal in the heart of Venice, the Gritti Palace boasts one of the most enthralling views of the whole Grand Lagoon from the city. From the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, past landmarks Punta del Dogana and Santa Maria della Salute Basilica, to the Peggy Guggenheim Museum collection. This palace dates back to 1475 and it was a noble palace and a luxury five-star five hotel in a place of exceptional art and elegance and it's retained its reassuringly intimate and familiar feel of a private residence, a private palatial residence. And from the design of its signature suites to its iconic terraces, the gritty Epicurean school Riva Yacht Experiences and the Riva Lounge and the Gritty SPA branded by Sicily Paris, the Gritty Palace is where multiple generations of elite global influencers gather to explore, taste and celebrate. And when it comes time to dine in Venice, it's also amazing. Maybe it's all that romance floating around, or maybe it's those deliciously pretty osterias, but food hits a little differently in Venice. The Serene Republic has a long history of innovative and world-leading cuisine that sits snugly with its historical Rome as a cultural hub and meeting point. Flavors, ingredients, and cooking styles have long collided here, as have the various cultures to pass or occupy Venice. So it makes sense that a lot of Venice's best restaurants all have such different approaches to food and cooking. There's a huge range of culinary delight on offer here. And here are a few of my tips. Each region of Italy has its own approach to food, but nowhere is it more diverse and exciting than in Venice. And the cuisine here is like the colorful frescoes that adorn the walls buildings and ceilings throughout the city. It's vivid and surprising, crumbling or faded in parts, but all richly laden with stories and seasoned with the history 
of cultural influences. The city's history as a wealthy merchant centre and military base gave its people access to spices and exotic ingredients from all corners of the globe, contributing to unusual flavours to the local food that is still present today. And the best way to experience or get a tasting of Venice is by sampling the various chiquetti, those small bites similar to Spanish tapas or French hors d'oeuvre, sold in Bacari or wine bars throughout the city. Now Venice is an experience that you do on foot. You walk pretty much everywhere, unless you're occasionally on a boat. And this means, serendipitously, you're bound to wander past a wine bar and bump into people you know, because it's quite a small town with a strong sense of community. So the culture of Cicchetti became a way for people to stay in touch. So when you're there, pretend you're a local and do the Cicchetti thing as often as you can. Another iconic place to, to munch is Harry's Bar at the Cipriani. It was a favourite of Ernest Hemingway and the bar to have said to be said to have invented the Bellini, which is Prosecco or sparkling wine with peach nectar. Harry's Bar is one of the most iconic places to eat and drink in all of Venice. This naturally means it's also one of the most expensive, whether it's one of the bar's original Bellinis, the atmosphere, or the authentic Italian cuisine it serves including many classic dishes such as risotto primavera, cipriano, carpaccio. The restaurant continues to attract celebrities and many more discerning diners to its tables. And then there's the terrazzo, or the terrazzo Danielli, which is the, on the, the, the alfresco deck of the Danielli Hotel, is also excellent, with a menu that showcases recipes dating back to 1909 including a dandolo, risotto and sea urchin, sole and fresh tomatoes, but that's really the point. Come here for one of the best views in Venice, overlooking the Grand Canal. And then there is Quadri. Now this is probably the most famous of all Venice restaurants, an institution since 1830, which recently received a facelift at the hands of the designer and architect Philippe Stock. Now the Michelin star restaurant's beloved Murano glass chandeliers illuminate the walls upholstered in highly original and playful fabric, designed by local textile artisans. To see these opulent dining rooms overlooking St. Mark's Square would be reason enough to visit, but seasonally inspired three or five course tasting menus are really the true attraction for the gastronomes. With every bite of asparagus and green pepper risotto and accompanying beetroot foam, you'll taste the promise of spring, primavera, and generous amused bouches are also playful and amusing. And then there is La Zucca, and this is a small canal-side dining room. La Zucca, translated means pumpkin in Italian, offers a romantic setting and one of Venice's most unique menus. Here, vegetables play the starring role, and the signature pumpkin and risotto flan is not to be missed. Yet the rotating menu also includes succulent specialties like roasted rabbit and chestnuts, uh, reservations are essential for two nightly sittings and the service can be quite rushed, even burly. But one taste of the house-made pear cake with ginger and those reservations will quickly disappear. And then there's the Met restaurant. Inside the world-famous five-star Hotel Metropole harnesses Venice's legacy as a once mighty trading empire of spices through a modern menu and atmosphere. 
Murano glass lamps cast a glow over luxurious fabrics, setting the stage for creative taste combinations in every course. With chef Luca Veritti at the helm, Met's very expensive tasting menus dazzle in their innovation and preparation. Foie gras in a cannoli pastry tube, delicate stacks of seafood carpaccio, or maybe even a chocolate sphere of tiramisu. Most notably, the vegetarian tasting menu infuses classic dishes with Asian elements, such as aubergine with beetroot and wasabi-flavored broccoli cream, topped with crunchy artichokes. It's romantic, velvety and candlelit, and the Met is true event dining. Buon appetito.